Other questions? Yes. Matt. The front here? Oh, hold on. They'll bring a microphone for you. Uh, thank you. So you mentioned about the different PIDM9 alleles in mouse causing sterility, but this also arises in humans, but doesn't cause sterility. Yeah. Can you comment? Yes, yeah, so we, um, along with every other species that's ever been looked at, have naturally occurring variation uh, in PRDM9. So as I showed you, some African people have different hotspots to some uh, European people. And that certainly doesn't cause any problems in fertility in humans. And I think the reason is that although this asymmetry starts to arise, um, as soon as populations get separated, it takes some time to do so. So the mice have been separated for something like a million years. And actually, in the black six mouse, the vast majority of its previous hotspots have been lost, and the same in the PWD mice. So there's almost complete um, asymmetry. Now, human populations, you know, we've only been apart for the blink of an eye in comparison of, you know, 50, 40,000 years, and there's just not been the time for this to happen. So if, if human populations did stay apart for hundreds of thousands of years, um, this st sort of thing might start to happen. And it's possible, for example, that that does play a role in, say, Neanderthal human um, hybrids. We know those occurred, and we also know that there were some fertility issues in those hybrids. Um, so, you know, it may have affected our species, but it's not affecting our species now. Yes. Are the binding motifs uh, exclusively intergenic? Or Sorry, are they exclusively? Intergenic. Do they happen in, in the intergenic regions only? Or? No, so um, hotspots are all over the genome. Um, so not only do they sometimes fall inside or outside of genes, uh, recombination normally works just fine, uh, they even often happen inside transposons. Um, so you might think it was a terrible idea to put you know, recombination into repetitive uh, elements, because it could start to rearrange your genome. But apparently, the system is robust enough that at least for somewhat diverse repeats, it's fine to recombine there. Um, there may be some evidence that you sort of avoid the most recently ar arrived repeats in the genome because they are more similar to one another. And that could be a factor in sort of changing how PRDM9 evolves. Um, transposons may also play a role in determining why PRDM9 evolves quickly. Um, but we really don't know quite why it evolves so fast, actually. Hotspot death. This may play a part, but we're not sure. Yeah. In the case where PRDM9 is not bound and you still get cleavage, yeah. is that the same cleavage enzyme that's in, is it SPO, whatever it's called? Yeah, so um, SPO11 is responsible for all the program double strand breaks in meiosis, right. I think. Um, so I'll give an exception in a second. But um, so. So I think there is very little recombination apart from at places where PRDM9 binds in mammals. Right. So basically, you know, we've looked in um, some mice and we look at actual events and more than 90% of them will happen in hotspots that we can identify, 95%. Mm -hmm. I think the rest are probably just weaker hotspots we didn't have significant mm -hmm. evidence for. So nearly all the breaks are programmed. Um, there is an exception actually in humans. Um, you see lots of um, short regions of recombination called gene conversions uh, in mothers, from mothers, um, and the number of those events um, increases with the age of a mother, and they have an outside hotspots. And so one hypothesis is that they are not SPO11 induced breaks, maybe they're sort of damaged over time because there's this arrest in meiosis. Um, and so it may be that those are kind of non-hotspot events um, that occur that aren't programmed but still somehow get repaired with the homologue. It's a surprise. Yeah, please. Uh, good evening. Um, recently, they have uh, uh, discovered that uh, there, w there was a lot of uh, variation in the first humans in Africa. Um, is it possible by using a PRD? M9 mm -hmm. to see how the species are different from the other species? Um, so I think it's quite hard. So, so, so there are lots of questions about human evolution, like how we evolved as a species, whether it was gradual, um, or whether it was a series of punctate events. And um, 
it may be that there, you know, lo lots of people think that um, in the distant past there were lots of these rather different, if you like, subspecies of humans. You know, we know about Neanderthals and many other ancient hominids, Denisovans, uh, and so on, that had rather deep evolutionary differences, and then they've mixed to some degree to form us um, today. And, and sort of the details are still being worked out. Now, um, it's by no means impossible that PRDM9 played some role in determining you know, how the hybridization could work. But we haven't got the time machine to kind of go back and uh, look at what alleles were present there. So we could try and do indirect things. Um, there is a field of sequencing ancient DNA, which is a very, very powerful thing to do. And one problem for using that to understand this gene is that you usually only get really small pieces of DNA. It's a technical challenge. And when you have these small pieces of DNA, it's quite hard to assemble these zinc finger arrays, which are sort of you know, the same thing again and again. So you don't know what order things um, come in. And so for that reason, we actually don't know if Neanderthals had the same PRDM9 um, allele as humans today. Um, or Denisovans, but you know, maybe careful targeted work could figure it out uh, one day. Right at the back. And, and yours is next. Yep. Cheers. Um, how about um, in cryptic speciation, such as in fungi, for example, is there evidence of the, your gene being involved there? Um, Luckily, I don't know much about speciation fungi, but I do know that PRDM9 isn't in them. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so actually, it's interesting. So, um, so PRDM9 is definitely widespread across mammals, but as you go outside mammals, it starts to become a lot more patchy. So um, you know, if you look on the databases, you see things that look a bit like PRDM9, but they don't necessarily have all the pieces in the right order, and they don't always show rapid evolution. Um, and there's been some lovely work by Molly Chaversky suggesting that um, as you go away from mammals, things are a bit patchy. Where, so it's likely that at least some fish and maybe some reptiles have it, um, and it works just the same as it does in us. Um, dogs don't have it. Um, it, it may be that marsupials um, also uh, don't have it. So as I say, it, it does get a bit patchy. Those species, um, in general, do have um, recombination hotspots, though, but they're just positioned differently. And yeast have recombination hotspots. Um, but... They may not have the same kind of thing going on in terms of their speciation unless those hotspots evolve quickly um, like ours do. And you know, what's going on with PNM9 is it's a very specific way that lets the hotspots always evolve uh, very quickly. Yep. In the middle here, just here. Thank you. Does it follow from the processes that you've described that geography has no effect on evolution of species apart from isolation? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say it that strongly, actually. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so what does in that case? Yeah, so um, what, what this says is, is it gives a particular mechanism by which what you said is true. So all that you really need to happen is it's almost like bad luck, you know, the, Geography does play a role in that it keeps the species separate, and then if they evolve for long enough, and if you know, the wrong combination of things happen in terms of what PRDM9 type the species or subspecies end up with, then they cannot um, hybridise. Um, but it's quite likely that, there, you know, even in these mice, um, you know, actually there are lots of other genes involved, and the hybrid zone um, has other barriers. For example, you see um, some mice with sperm uh, that have sort of swim in strange ways and stuff that don't relate just to PRDM9. So there's probably a sort of milieu of genes that are contributing. Um, but this system's of interest because it's the one with complete sterility. It's the sort of strongest possible form of um, incompatibility. So, whether, so what happens in general, you know, in terms of speciation in mammals, I think lots of things must contribute. Um, but I think this, as a sort of, you can think of it as a push towards speciation, um, there's no reason to think it doesn't repeatedly happen because we know that over evolutionary time, these hotspots are always being lost in us and um, many other species. So I think it could be that push, but it isn't going to be the only thing. There is some adaptive change. Yes. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. It was really amazing. Um, 
I'm just uh, wondering that um, the, the, you're putting a lot of responsibility on PDR9 <laughs> to be uh, the cause of a, such an enormous evolutionary step. Is there any possibility that there are other genes that could be involved? Um, so actually, even in the... Um, th there are genes that... If I take this system as an example, this mouse one, um, so one thing I showed you at the beginning was that there are differences depending on which way round the cross goes. So if your mother is a PWD, you're infertile. If, you're, if your mother is black six, you're semi-fertile. And um, usually it's actually done some work to try and narrow down what's going on there. And it, it turns out to be things on the X chromosome. So different X chromosomes, different effect. So there are other genes that play a role in this system. Uh, there's some evidence of genes also in other parts of the autosomes, but they seem to have smaller effects than this one. So they modify you know, how bad things are, um, but don't fix things. And the problem with understanding that is those, we don't know what the specific genes are to look at them yet. So this is the only one that's really been narrowed down, and it probably has the strongest um, Is there anything effect. on the Y chromosome? Um, so I think in other systems, yes. Uh, but in this system, I think, no, it's definitely the X yeah. um, that controls things. Yeah. Go ahead, Sensei. Hey, so uh, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned that recombination is the key benefit of sex by yeah. controlling the force of natural selection through genetic variation. Yeah. But at the end, you mentioned the purpose of hotspots is to refine search and increase genetic uh, viability. Yeah. So these seem, uh, which means that it's not an adaptive event. So uh, to me, these seem like contradictory points. So how might you explain the initial evolution and subsequent dominance of uh, sexual reproduction despite significant cost to the individual? Um, so we're not actually contradictory points, they're somewhat different points. So um, the point about recombination is that that shuffling of material is what we need to happen. Okay? So that means that we need to evolve, you know, for evolution to work optimally, we need to evolve a system where we put mutations on new backgrounds. And one reason why that's good is, um, suppose you're a favourable mutation, but you're unlucky, and there are other disfavourable mutations on the same chromosome. Most mutations, after all, are probably disfavourable if they have any effect. Without recombination, you can't escape those bad mutations. So evolution has to choose to take the good with all the bad um, or not take the good. Well, with recombination, you can sort of just take the good thing and then get rid of the bad. And so you need to sort of have that effect of shuffling variation. But the question is, we didn't know of any reason, to my knowledge, there isn't any known reason why recombination should cluster into these tiny little places. You know, given that model, you might think it'd be better to do it at some level everywhere. OK, so recombine somewhere level everywhere so you can always split things up. In a hotspot world, there are sort of blocks of material that can't be broken up by recombination because they don't have hotspots within them. And that would seem bad. And the point is that the counter um, argument, probably why they have arisen, is because they aid this pairing as well. So now recombination has been used for two things at once. Firstly, for shuffling variation, but also for helping find that homologue. And, you know, as far as I know, species like this crazy one with 50 chromosomes, those are always hot spotty species because <laughs> that's a hard pairing problem. There's one behind just there. And we'll make this the last one. Uh, cheers. So, um, you talked about um, signposts uh, being put up where the uh, breaks occur within the DNA. Mm -hmm. And it would seem these are almost uh, vital to, um, for the uh, uh, re- uh, binding to occur. So um, would you have any comment on um, how these uh, signposts are formed or, or what they're uh, made of in any way? Yeah, I can. So um, we don't actually, it's one of the things we don't know. Um, so what we do know is that when PDM9 binds, um, uses the zinc fingers to bind and there are all these other bits and pieces of a protein that I rather glossed over. Um, so one of those has an effective um, <coughs> So technically what it does is it trimethylates lysine 4 of histone 3. Um, but what one can think of that as saying is that um, your DNA in cells, in order to fit in your cells, is wrapped around things called histones. And those histones can have things essentially stuck to them to modify them. Um, and one of those modifications is made by PDM9. And those modifications can be recognized by other proteins. Um, and actually, PDM9 makes at least two different modifications. There's also something called H3K36. Um, ME3, and we don't actually know whether it's those modifications singly or in concert, or PDM9 binding itself, that's kind of a trigger for this recognition. Um, 
what people have started to see is that when you prevent PRDM9 doing that job, um, you get infertility, uh, just like if you knock out the gene in mice. Um, well, okay. it's now my pleasure to present you with this Crick medal. Thank you very much. And to say thank you very much for an extremely informative talk, beautifully presented. Thank you thank very you. much. Clap again if you like, a commemorative scroll. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the scroll.